welcome to Adventures in Coffee, a podcast by Caffeine Magazine, sponsored by Oatly. Now in this second series of Adventures in Coffee, Scott and I explore the world of coffee for people who are curious about what goes into their daily cup. Yes, we are all trying to understand the provenance of our food and drink. So uh, we I'm made... sorry, provenance? Oh, okay, fancy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as I was saying... We made this podcast to stick the spoon into the tasty world of coffee. Now, I am Jules Walker, that woman that you're going to see riding around on a bike in East London, going to her favourite coffee shops and enjoying being an everyday coffee lover. I am Scott Bentley. I am the founder of Caffeine Magazine. And according to my dad, apparently I'm a bit of a coffee nerd. And in today's episode, we're going to be exploring the wonderful world of coffee flavours. I am going to help you, dear listener, pinpoint those flavours. I am going to help you on your journey to become a flavour naught. Scott, have you been spending too much time watching the kids' TV programmes again? <laughs> I do have two kids, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, Scott, tell me, why are you so interested and so invested in regards to like flavours and, and coffee? What, what's that about? Yeah, absolutely. This is definitely a soapbox, which I've been like standing on for many a year now, uh, <laughs> shouting into the distance with my megaphone and literally everyone's got earplugs in. <laughs> but the point here is that um, if I gave someone a cup of coffee and said, what do you taste? I would generally get the answer, coffee. Mm. But if I gave you a glass of wine and said, what does that taste like? I doubt that many people will come back to me and go, it tastes like wine. They would understand. I think their level of appreciation and knowledge of wine tasting has been in the part of the, you know, the consciousness of people for a number of years now. So they mm. would understand that what I'm saying is, we know you're tasting wine, but what does the wine taste like? And I think that is a, an appreciation we don't have for coffee. So that's why I want to take on this journey and essentially start giving you the tools so our dear listener can appreciate the galaxy of flavours that are out there. All right then, Scott, tell us what we're in for today. Okay, so this episode, I'm going to be speaking to my dear father. I never call him my father. I'm talking to my dad. Um, and trying to prove to him that coffee doesn't just taste like coffee. And then I'm going to speak to some like real experts in flavour and you know, and tasting, and trying to get like a simple framework that we can all work to, and how we can all be better tasters. Mm -hmm. uh, and lastly, I'm going to unpack the question: Where do coffee flavours come from? And I know you're going to say, "Ah, oh, the beans." <laughs> <laughs> but what I really mean is, how does the flavour get into those beans? OK, Scott, so you mentioned how most people don't really get coffee flavours and don't necessarily have the vocabulary, I suppose, to, to discuss what it is that they're tasting. And Scott, I've actually got a great example to share with you on that. for something that happened in my house yesterday. Mm. So I had a film crew kind of take over my my living room because I was doing some some bike related work at home, which involved me being hot and sweaty on a turbo trainer, which I'm sure the, the dear listener can appreciate <laughs> and maybe smell through the mic. I don't know. But, <laughs> um, you know, we had a, a, a crew over and Ian, bless him, he had the, the day off. So he was able to, to help out and he was making rounds of coffee for, for everyone. And I'm like, OK, cool, cool. I'm there breaking out the ultimate sweat, doing the workout on the turbo trainer. And in the distance, I'm hearing Ian and the cameraman nerding out to the extreme. Scott, you would have loved it about coffee. <laughs> and, you know, they were talking about the, the smells, the flavours, the notes, the profiles. They were talking about the differences between natural coffees and washed coffees. And I was just like, yeah, OK, cool. Cool. I can't get involved because I'm actually busy sweating like a beast. And also, I'm the person that co-hosts a podcast about coffee and I can't get involved in this conversation. I was feeling like even if I wasn't completely out of breath, there would only be a certain point as to where I feel like I could get involved. And, and the thing is, Scott, is that I don't want to feel like a fool when I open my mouth and say something. Well, Jules, I've got some great news for you. And mm. that is when we finish this episode... Hopefully, you'll be able to have that conversation with your boyfriend and the coffee nerd cameraman. Uh, and I'm hoping we're going to give you enough tools 
and also confidence to realize that you can have those conversations. And if I haven't done that by the end of this episode, I think I might have failed you and I really don't want to fail you. <laughs> let's let's see how this goes. If, if you have failed me, I'm going to make you do a really, really long session on the turbo trainer as punishment. I need to get rid of this belly. So yeah, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> but before that, let's have a quick word from our sponsor. And here is a sustainability hack brought to you by Only. Jules, do you remember in the last series, one of the things we learned was over 50% of the carbon footprint in our cup of coffee, and this is without milk, by the way, mm -hmm. you know, straight black, Yeah, just comes from the action of boiling that kettle. Mind-blowing. Only has sent us some amazing statistics on this. Mm. Here in the UK, we make 165 million cups of coffee tea per day and 70 million cups of coffee we're boiling kettles like up to 235 million times a day you know the other thing that we learned from our friends at Oatly as well most of us usually end up boiling twice as much water as we actually need right so you you make your cup of tea mm -hmm. or your cup of coffee yeah and you've boiled another cup's worth in that kettle that you're just never going to use uh-huh and that translates as us pretty much needlessly wasting around 3525 tons of co2 every day jules those kind of numbers they just don't <laughs> even register in my brain i've got you fam so picture a plane on the runway at an airport mm. and it's going to be going from London Heathrow to New York. Right. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Now picture another one. Okay. And then another one. All right. And there's another one. Well, we're up to four now. So After that, there's then... another one. Okay. And then another one is just taken How's off. How's this going on for, Jules? Uh -huh. got... That is going on 6,000 times from New York and back every day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We must have a solution here. Pour the water into your cup first. Just fill it up with water, okay. right to the brim, yeah. and then pour that into your kettle. I'll probably spill half it on the counter by <laughs> doing that. Clumsy. So maybe I'll do it over the sink. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know, if, you know that, if, I know that. If you're clumsy <laughs> like Scott, dear listener, make sure that you do, do it, it over, over the, the sink. sink. Jules, thanks very much. Another great hack. A pleasure. And that was a sustainability hack brought to you by Oatly. So Jules, to set you up on this journey, I wanted to share with you an experiment I tried to do with my dad. <laughs> so I called him up hello, hello, and hello. I got him on the line. Okay, but what, what's the experiment that, that you set up with your dad then? Tell me. So what I'm going to do is try and help people, maybe like my father, realise that you know coffee doesn't just taste like coffee. Mm. And this is an experiment in two halves. And... What I'm going to do is in the second part of this experiment, I've got a little magic trick up my sleeve. Okay, so why did you choose your dad for this experiment then? Yeah, so the thing is, for, for this test, I wanted someone who just, you know, really wasn't that super fussy. I mean, he's a man of relatively simple tastes and, he, you know, none of his career had anything to do with gastronomy or flavours or anything like that. I did a um, bit of an apprenticeship in the RAF and then went into the motor trade and I ended up at uh, 23 years at, uh, at Nissan as a, uh, a motor manufacturer. And when it comes to coffee, you know, he's just not that fussy, really. <laughs> coffee is coffee, isn't it? I don't know, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, coffee is uh, co coffee, is coffee, and uh, it's a legal high. <laughs> I, just, I just have to say, I love the sound of your dad. I really genuinely do. And it, it sounds like he's had a very interesting life as well. But, but anyway, I digress because I'll get very sort of like dad emotional here. But tell me about the experiment. What actually went down with you and your dad with this coffee experiment, Scott? Okay, so... We got a coffee from our dear friends at Pact, and it was a Brazilian coffee. And I got my dad to brew this up. There we go. Uh, but just to be clear, I actually sent him the bag, but I'd scrubbed all the tasting notes off of it. Oh, okay. So he brewed up the coffee to my exacting specifications, might I add. Of course. Oh, there we are. That's, that's, that's two minutes gone. So it's probably three minutes since I put it in to start with. And I then asked him what he tasted. Let's uh, have a sip. Um, coffee. It smells like coffee. Tastes like coffee. Scott, okay, although I am loving this. This cannot have been your whole experiment, Scott. 
Like you, you gave your lovely dad a cup of coffee and he correctly guessed that he was drinking a cup of coffee. This isn't it. This is not it, right? <laughs> I did actually send him the bag so he could see it was coffee. It wasn't like it was even a blind <laughs> test or anything like that. Now, the next bit, I want you to listen to how my dad is describing these coffee flavours because we're going to come back to this. It tastes reasonably strong, I suppose. It's um, it's not it's not bitter, but it's a it's it's a strong cup of coffee. Um, it's an okay taste. It's strong. It's not bitter, but it's an okay taste. So I then brought out my little trick. Oh. And I asked him to brew up now a second different cup of coffee. Uh, okay, then, Scott, this is your trick. You've put two coffees side by side for your dad. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> okay, Paul Daniels. Okay. So I'd like you to have a sip of this and see if you uh, can give me anything on that. It doesn't taste as strong, so it's it, it tastes probably um, a bit lighter in the in the in the mouth. Yeah, not so much flavour, but a different sort of flavour. So it's it, as I say, it's it's much lighter. Um, it's quite smooth. Mm. Coffee is coffee, but this is a um, completely different to the to the first. Okay, so there's there's a twist coming here because your your dad is still very much of the the coffee is coffee, but now all of a sudden he's tasting this and he's talking about it being lighter in the mouth, mm, and then he's yeah. talking about the different sort of flavors and that it's quite smooth. So something's happening here, isn't it? There is now this this split is developing, uh, and this is it. I think this is literally where we're rewiring his brain, <laughs> and certainly you know. You've enlightened me that, well, coffee isn't all, you know, all coffees aren't the same. They are, um, you know, coffees are different. And uh, tasting these two side by side, then that really sort of shows that, um, uh, that, that there are differences. I like this little insight into the, the coffee journey that you've taken your father on. Yeah, I don't think we've moved, you know, a huge distance, but I think just by doing this one tiny experiment, it gets people to open up the idea mm. that coffee can taste of different things. And the interesting thing here is that my dad knew there was a difference, mm. but did you notice maybe how difficult it was for him to either find the right vocabulary? It doesn't taste as strong, so it's it, it tastes... Or essentially express what those differences were. Not so much flavour, but a different sort of flavour. So before he was having difficulty expressing what he was tasting, so I worked with him, you know, had some quite pointed, specific questions, and then I think he was getting pretty close. We'd moved from these strong, not bitter, okay taste to something far more specific. It's, really, it's quite sort of fruity. Does that make sense? Perhaps berries, some sort of berries. Okay, there's there's a real development and a real journey going on here with your father. Yeah, and I think this is the same for everyone. It, you you can pick out these nuances. You just need a little bit of confidence about what you're tasting. Mm. And what they need is just a, a simple framework to think about how to appreciate different coffees. So that's why I got on the line to this person. My name is Frida Yuan, and I'm the head of coffee of Origin Coffee Roasters. I am the three times UK cup tasting champion. I'm also a Q grader and I also did third at the world cup tasting champion in 2017. Jules, I bought the, I bought the big guns out because I was so intimidated by you bringing out the big guns. I thought I'll bring some big guns this time. <laughs> this is all very impressive indeed with Frida, but what's a Q grader and mm. a cup taster? A cup taster mm -hmm. is not someone that licks cups. That's called a dishwasher. <laughs> but basically, when you're when you're doing cup tasting, especially in cup tasting competitions, you have this uh, triangulation of three coffees. Two of them are the same, mm -hmm. and one is different. And mm -hmm. the idea is you have to taste these coffees and work out what the different one is. Now, that might be quite easy if they're very different coffees, but. They generally aren't. They're generally very, very similar coffees. It's quite a thing to uh, to be able to do. Uh, yeah, and I suppose the Q grader thing, in some ways, you can think of them like a coffee sommelier. Mm. 
So when I spoke to Frida, what I was basically after was a framework that I could give people, maybe like my dad, uh, of how they can approach tasting coffee. Frida, I'm just thinking back to my dad. The next time he brews up a cup of coffee, have you got like a, I don't know, maybe like a three-point framework, something like that, where the first thing he does is he drinks some coffee and he thinks, hmm, what can I taste? Uh, yeah, so what you could do is ask him to identify this three categories. The first would be floral, and then that would be fruity. And then that would be, I would say, nutty or chocolatey. All right. This is a framework I can get on on board with. So these three points that it's, you know, floral, fruity and chocolatey, trying to identify that. Yeah. So all coffees have this spectrum of flavours. Some are much more in the background, some much more in the foreground, obviously. So the next time you drink a cup of coffee, maybe think about what am I tasting? Is it florals? Is it nutty? Or is it fruity? And also, to what extent can you taste each of these? Um, But it doesn't just stop there. Okay, I'm very intrigued now. I've sent you a link to the SCA coffee flavour wheel, and we'll also link it in our show notes. I'm I'm having a look at the flavour wheel that you've sent to me, Scott, and it's incredible. Other than the fact it's very pretty to look at is the first thing that that got me. It's a swatch of flavours and... The colours that go with it, the fact I'm looking at things skipping from one minute it could taste of of clove and then the next moment you've got like rubber or skunky on there as well. I'm I'm following it through like a a, a very interesting rainbow. I'm going to explain to our dear listener who may not be seeing this at the moment exactly how this flavour wheel works. It's essentially three concentric circles. And the way you use this chart is that you start in the centre. And the centre has a number of generic flavour types. So it's got everything from nutty, sweet, Mm -hmm. floral, and a few more things on there as well. But we won't get into them right now. Mm. But you find the generic flavour thing that you can identify. And that might just be fruit. So you're kind of, you're drinking some coffee and you kind of think, hmm, it's a bit fruity. So you're in that section now, you're in the fruity section. Mm -hmm. You think to yourself, what kind of fruit am I getting? Maybe what colour fruit am I getting? Is it a dark fruit or is it a bright fruit? So let's say it's a yellowy fruit. Let's say it's a citrus fruit. Right. You then go into the citrus section, which is next. That's the second concentric ring. Mm -hmm. And then... Firing out from that citrus fruit ring are more citrus fruits. And there's grapefruit, orange, lemon, lime. So you then think to yourself, what am I tasting? Am I tasting grapefruit here? Or am I tasting lemon here? Or am I tasting orange or lime? And so you've gone from drinking some coffee, thinking, Mm -hmm. hmm, it's quite fruity. Mm. What kind of fruit? It's a yellow fruit. What kind of yellow fruit? It's kind of like a grapefruit. And there you are. You've made that line. Then you you check it against the bag and you realise you're completely wrong. (laughs) Now, you know this whole thing about crazy flavour notes on coffee bags? I bought this up with Frida. So my dad goes into a coffee shop. He sees the word strawberry on a bag of like Ethiopian coffee. And then he phones me up and he goes, Scott, it's got strawberry here. I'm not tasting strawberry. Could you maybe unpack maybe why he's not tasting strawberry? So when we put up tasting notes, we try our best to put things into words. And sometimes coffee itself is really complex that has so many different nuances that it is sometimes really hard to grasp. So what we could do is try to find the bigger direction of the flavor notes. Having strawberry on the flavor notes doesn't really mean your dad will taste strawberry. Sometimes it can be just that aroma when we first bite on the strawberry. Mm. And then it probably can be, we talk about the acidity of the strawberry, but it is an indicator for people who are interested in trying to explore, try to understand how coffee tastes like, and then we trying to match it up for them. 
You see, Scott, I get this with the strawberries specifically because I still like eating strawberry jawbreakers. But I know that the strawberry flavouring I'm going to have in that sweet is going to taste completely different to the strawberry hit that I'll get from a, a jar of jam, which is then going to be really different to picking my own strawberries in the field and eating them fresh. Now, Jules, there is a temptation for people to use this flavour wheel whenever they're trying to pinpoint coffee flavours. But there is actually a big problem with this flavour wheel. A problem that Frida has helped me realise. So, you know, for instance, you'll see one of the flavours here is blueberries. But For example, I'm from Taiwan. I came to UK eight years ago. And before I came to UK, I personally never tried blueberries before. So for, for me, blueberries doesn't mean anything to me when I was in Taiwan until I come to UK. You see, the thing is, Scott, with what Frida said there, I can get on board with that. I grew up in the UK and, you know, I grew up with, with West Indian parents, but I was also eating fruits like lychees or I was having pomsite or I was having chenna. And, you know, I'm saying these things to you. You may have no idea what, what I'm talking about, but it's just the, the fact that these flavours do exist. And say, for instance, I have a cup of coffee and I feel like I can taste notes of chenna in it. Because it's not on on that flavour wheel that we're having a look at, that doesn't mean that I'm wrong because it hasn't been stated as one of the definitive flavours that I will pull from, from said coffee, from said reason. So, you know, things are culturally specific. Nobody has a, a right or wrong palate. It's just the fact that there is so much more out there and things like the flavour wheel don't necessarily cover it. All right, Scott, I've got to go back to this flavour wheel that I'm looking at. As, as beautiful as it is, the amount of flavours that I am looking at on here and the different levels that they go to feels absolutely crazy. So, mm. you know, we've got berries and blueberries. And then if you spin over to the wheel, you've got chemicals and petroleum. Yeah. So, <laughs> like one minute I'm tasting berries and the next minute I'm, I'm guzzling petrol. This is very bizarre. It's a party in your mouth, isn't it, Jules? It's a party that I'm not sure that I want to have. I'm not sure how I feel about like <laughs> going to a local petrol station and just guzzling down some, some, some good old fuel. It depends fuel. on the vintage of the D's life. <laughs> I find a 95 was really quite good. <laughs> That's a fine year. It's a very, very fine year. But in, in all seriousness, though, Scott, like, where do all of these flavours come from? I'm glad you asked. Because this is exactly what I asked a friend of the show, Deanna. So my name is Deanna, and I've been in the industry for about 17 years. I'm a licensed Q grader, the current UK roasting champion, and I'm completing a postgrad in coffee excellence at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences alongside my day-to-day -day job as the head of quality for DR Wakefield, which is a green importer in London. Speaking to Deanna, she broke down this basically three things which really affect coffee's flavour. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's going to take us on a bit of a world tour. So we're going to talk about where the coffee is grown geographically, mm -hmm. how that coffee is processed... Mm. and then how that coffee is actually roasted. Okay. And if you change any of these variables, you will completely change the taste of that coffee. And it can be as much as, you know, night and day. I'm not saying it's going to be, you know, petrol to sort of like, you know, blueberries, <laughs> but you can shift these parameters pretty radically. And I'm hoping that this is really going to help our listeners understand what's printed on their coffee bags. The first thing that we're going to start with is to discuss terroir, which is essentially a fancy word for where the coffee is grown. And uh, Deanna is going to explain how this is one of the first ways in which you know flavour gets into the coffee. So let's take five origins, just really broad brushstrokes, OK? We've got Brazil. A lot of people have had Brazilian coffee. It's a big origin. And it's really known for like chocolate, nuts. If you contrast that to somewhere like Kenya, you'll notice that when you pick up a Kenyan coffee, you're probably going to have kind of like an effervescent acidity. You know, the feeling that orange juice gives you in your mouth in contrast to like milk, right? It's got that kind of sparkling sensation. And then you go over to Colombia and Colombia is really known for this kind of apple characteristic. It can be red apple, can be green apple, but it has this kind of apple and caramel thing going on. And then, of course, we've got one of the favorites, which is Ethiopia. Super complex origin, but you get these 
floral notes sometimes. You get some forest fruit sometimes. You get like stone fruits. And then just to just chuck one in there, if you go all the way over to Sumatra, you're going to have sometimes this kind of guava note. You're also going to sometimes have some spiciness. So you've got five origins there that already have some attributes they tend towards. I mean, you you know that if you're buying wines from a certain region, they're probably going to have certain characteristics to them. Mm. And I think that's the kind of the same with coffee. Yeah. So if I'm going to apply wine logic to, to coffee logic and regions, I would end up leaning towards a Brazilian coffee if I wanted my coffee to, to taste more like chocolate or more nutty. Mm. And then yeah. if I did want something a bit more apple then I'd mm. go to Colombia. Yeah. But I mean, and this is something that Deanna spoke to, and it's, we, we need to be careful because mm. there are huge variations within each country. So if you look at, let's just take one state in Brazil. There's a state called Minas Gerais. And if you look at that state and you take two regions, you take the Cerrado region, which is flatter and hotter. And then you take the Mantiqueira de Minas region, which is on slopes and it has altitude. You'll notice differences even between those two Brazilian coffees where one is going to have more of your chocolate and nuts, which is the Cerrado region. The other, the Mantiqueira region, is going to have a bit more acidity, maybe some stone fruits. And that's coming from that slope, that altitude. But the next thing that really, really impacts flavour is processing. And I know this is going to sound like really boring, but it's actually <laughs> one of the most exciting. And it's where a lot of innovation comes in in coffee. And what I've noticed is that certain countries, which, you know, for me personally, would I would suggest are quite pedestrian coffees. Mm. This is where they can really come alive when we really start putting in some like these wacky, you know, processing things. Whereabouts in, in the whole chain of your coffee being produced as this, this happened? The processing essentially happens on the farm. So what we really want once we've picked those cherries is the seed inside of that cherry, right? Because the seed is essentially what you know of as the coffee beans, right? So what we want is to get the seed out so that eventually we can roast it so that you can drink a cup of coffee of it. So what we need to do then is put it through something called processing. Now there's a lot of different types of processing out there. Actually, it's a minefield, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> but let's just start with the two, probably the most common ones that you'll see on a bag before getting into the stuff that's like super geeky, right? So we've got washed and we've got natural. So, you know, I'm I'm thinking like, you know, a sort of washed coffee is is pure and clean and maybe, you know, smells all all lovely and coffee like and and natural is almost like, you know, like when you've been out jogging and it's that natural smell that oozes <laughs> from you, that kind of like raw naturalness that comes from the body. Is 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 that where we're going with washed and natural, Scott? I don't think you're probably as far away as you think you are. Let's go first to Deanna discussing what natural is. So you've got these cherries. You've picked some super ripe cherries. They're going to be really sweet. You're going to take those cherries. You're going to select the best of them, right? And you're going to take them out and you're going to put them out to dry. The fruit itself is going to dry around that seed. Ideally, you're going to put it in like a raised bed. So if you imagine a big rack, almost kind of like a big rack with a little bit of a netting under it that just holds those cherries so that the air can come in and out. We get a nice, even drying. I mean, if you imagine you wanted to do some dried apricots at home or something like that, you'd want to mm. basically get as much airflow through that as possible at the same time as the right temperatures, right? And with that, you're literally drying that until that cherry's nice and dry. And you're going to just remove that cherry, all the outside. You're going to end up with the seed and this little casing around it called parchment. And then when you're ready to go, you're going to export that and that's going to be your seeds without that little shell, right? That's natural. Natural is literally take the coffee, select the best stuff, dry it whole with the cherry around it, then remove that cherry and you've got your little seed inside. So Jules, I like to think of naturally processed coffees sometimes a little bit like ageing. You're essentially letting these coffee cherries steep in their own juices. Okay. So the flavours of natural processing can be really intense. I mean, it mm. can be really super funky and interesting. What you're going to end up with is a coffee that's actually quite often quite sweet, right? Quite fruity. Sometimes you get a little bit of this like boozy note, a little bit like you can get a little bit of that rum or kirsch. You'll get like more bold fruity flavors. 
fruit bombs. The fruit bombs often. Like if you get a natural Ethiopia. Woo! Yeah, this, this all sounds quite delicious. Okay, so we're now going to talk about the other really common type of processing, which is washed. Mm. So if you think of natural coffee as some like aged, you know, really old cheese, which has been kind of like going mouldy for a few years. Mm. What we're going to talk about here, the washed element is something super young, super fresh, like really, really clean tasting. So washed, it's, it's named washed because you're essentially washing the coffee. So what you've got is you've got that cherry, you've got your nice ripe cherries, and what you want to do on the wash process is you're going to try to remove all that cherry. Around that, you're still going to have this little layer, and it's kind of like a gooey layer, and it's called mucilage, right? So what you do is you put those mucilage-covered seeds in like a tank so that the layers kind of slowly but surely fall off over time because basically it's fermentation. Basically, that's what happens. And then you're going to rinse it with water, you're going to wash the coffee so that all the rest of that kind of mucilage and any cherry and anything else around it comes off and you've got this nice seed with the parchment on the outside, right? And then you're going to dry it. Instead of drying it in the whole cherry like you did before, you're going to actually dry it just in the parchment with a seed. So Jules, let me just recap. The natural process, you're baking that cherry on Mm. and then the wash process, you're essentially stripping it and washing it off. Just think about the cherry, Mm. all the juice from that cherry gets baked into the seed. Mm. And the other one, you strip it all off, you wash it all off, and it's as clean as possible. So what does the the washed one taste like then? What you get more of is like really complex flavors, actually, but a very what we call a clean cup. It's not going to have crazy kind of funky flavors or boozy flavors. It's going to have more like pronounced acidity, for example. It's going to have more balance. It's a bit more mild. So if you're not a person who likes you know, big, crazy, fruity, like what's going on in my cup? This is going to taste like, you know, Kirsch Royale or something like that. You might prefer a washed coffee. If you're more like, you know what? I like a coffee to taste nice and balanced. A little bit of caramel, be a little bit of orange, you know, maybe some peach there, you know, nice, delicate, mild flavors. You're probably going to more likely like the washed. Jules, we got one thing left. Mm. One thing that's really going to affect coffee's flavour. Okay, you, you need to tell me what this is because I'm salivating going through all of these flavour notes that we've been discussing and I'd quite like to go to my kitchen and make coffee at this point. <laughs> okay, it's the roast. Ah. Basically, green coffee that we get you know, from the farm, from the importer, that is pre-roasted coffee and they call it green coffee it is mm. is sort of like gray green mm. but essentially if you try to drink this it's awful if you roast it too lightly it really tastes vegetal and almost like grass like ah. but the real brilliance is in this roast it's these chemical reactions the Maillard reaction, which essentially is the caramelising effect, is the same thing as you know why toasts taste so bloody great. It's that <laughs> sort of slight caramelisation that you're effectively doing in the sugars here. Mm. Now, and the longer you do this, the longer you roast this, the darker the coffee gets, and the coffee flavours change again. And and then if you go too dark you obviously just get burnt flavours. But there's a sweet spot. There's this beautiful sweet spot that all coffees are in, which is effectively between that grassy stage and this sort of burnt stage. And, you know, those flavours that you really, really love, those chocolatey, nutty flavours, a lot of this stuff is done in the roasting stage. Chocolate and caramel flavours. Those are the most notable things that people perceive within a cup of coffee. And I would say that, Every coffee I taste in a lab, regardless of if it's a very fruity coffee or a more nutty coffee, it still has some very base things, which are chocolate and caramel in them. And that's coming from the roasting process. So if that's the case, how does roasting lighter versus roasting darker Mm. affect the coffee? I am glad you asked, Jules. Now, I spoke to Deanna and we used the example of an Ethiopian natural coffee. From that, I would be expecting it to be quite fruity and quite floral, right? Mm. And then if it's a natural Ethiopian, it's going to be, I guess, less, not less smooth, but it's it's going to be a bit of a, a funkier taste to it. Absolutely. Well done, student Jules. <laughs> Gold, Gold star. star. 
Yeah. Now, if we roast this coffee very lightly. So in your lighter roast, you imagine just these fresh blueberries and, and forest fruit sitting in that cup, right? And you can imagine that crunchiness even when you bite on that kind of that feeling of freshness there, right? And at the same time, it's quite big, quite punchy. Like punch, right? Like imagine you take all of them and you 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 turn them into a juice. Okay. So if you're going to roast it light, you're going to get much fresher flavours or, you know, more bite with them, right? So in this example that you and Deanna were talking about, the coffee tastes like you're eating a bowl of really fresh fruit. Yep, exactly, Jules. And then if you roast these coffees a bit longer and a bit darker... Get a little bit more of that chocolate, a little bit of that clove, still some fruit there. So like forest fruit gatto, mm. like a little bit more like... The deep, dark chocolate cake with like, you know, with some fruit there. You know, cake, it's like, it's a bit heavier than, than, than sorbet or than juice, right? Still has some fruit, but definitely your kind of star there are more on the sides of the chocolate and the clover and like kind of darker fruits. Sounds more like a Black Forest Gatto. Yes, that's it. All right, I now want a really, really lovely cup of coffee and I want a slice of Black Forest Gatto with it, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hungry, I'm not even joking. <laughs> This has been quite the journey to to go on. I mean, initially, you know, starting off with your dad and your dad very much being like, coffee tastes like coffee, coffee is coffee. And now just all of these different intricacies about flavour and the processing, if it's washed, if it's natural, the difference that roasting will make, things like that. It's just all of these things make such a difference to the very humble coffee bean and all of these different flavours that can pop out of it as per that colour wheel that we were looking at as well. It's just, there's a lot going on with it. Mm. And it's, it's you know, some people may find it borderline geeky, but it's actually geeky, cool, interesting. And I've enjoyed this. I've really, really enjoyed this. And I, I genuinely feel like I want to sit down and study the flavour wheel. So, Jules, if we rewind to the start of this episode, I remember mm. you discussed a situation where you felt a little bit out of your depth in terms of like, the coffee bants that was kind of going on at the time. Yeah. Do you feel now that that might be a slightly different situation if it happened again? Maybe you would see Jules unclipping from the turbo trainer and taking my sweaty self over to my beloved boyfriend and the, the cameraman and actually getting involved in that conversation, taking a sip of that mm. coffee and just be able to have the confidence to say that I am tasting notes of peach or I'm tasting notes of Black Forest Gatto or something like that. Do you know what mm. I mean? And you wouldn't feel stupid about it or you wouldn't feel like you're winging it. Yeah. You, it's, your, it's your palette. It's my palette. So I'll get the, the film crew to come back just so that I can yeah. get hot and sweaty again and then, then we'll revisit the situation. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> Jules, been another great adventure. It has indeed. I think we should really roll the credits. <laughs> Let's go. This podcast was produced by James Harper, the creator of the coffee podcast Filter Stories. And James also writes and plays the piano music that you hear in the background. Now, if you like the show, which I'm sure you do, please subscribe on your podcast app. And you can also help others out there find the show by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. You can follow me on Instagram at Caffeine Mag, Jules at Lady Velo, and James Harper at Filter Stories Podcast. Now, please get on your social media and answer us this question. What is the most interesting cup of coffee you've ever drank? Now, if you want to really nerd out on some coffee flavours, you can pick up Freedy Yan's book, Sip and Slurp, a guide to expert coffee tasting, and 5% of the book's profit will go to Mental Health Foundation. And you can also follow Deanna on Instagram at baristasaurus13, and there is also a link in the show notes to that too. I wish I had that handle. That's amazing. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? It's really quite, quite clever. Now, in our next episode, we're bringing you the second in our mini-series, Adventures in Your Kitchen. Yay! And in Adventures in Your Kitchen, we are going to help you master the world of cow juice or oat juice. Basically, all the steamable juices that are out there. <laughs> <laughs> and we're speaking to two world experts in this topic. I'm very excited about this because we are going to be speaking to Morgan Eckcroft, also known as Morgan Drinks Coffee, to help you steam great milk at home, even if you are on a budget. And we're also going to be speaking to the lovely Heidi Phillips-Smith on how to begin your journey as a world latte art champion. And she has got form here. <laughs> 
But until then, take care and we will speak to you again in a couple of weeks. <laughs>